Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Kate and Chris from Spira Farms in Chicago, Illinois. Kate and Chris have recently expanded into a 5,000 square foot farm from very humble beginnings just a few years ago. They've created some really cool innovations for their farm, including converting a barbecue into a tray washer. Chris and Kate have some great lessons to share from their farming journey, so let's get right into it. Welcome to the podcast, Kate and Chris. I'm super excited to have you on and uh, and share more about your farm and how you guys got into microgreens. So maybe we could just start by hearing, yeah, the backstory of how you started on this journey to start Spiro Farms and uh, and just get into microgreens in general. Yeah, happy to talk about it. Thanks for having us. Uh, so years ago, I think it was 2018, I was doing my master's time on uh, data analytics, and I was I was writing a paper. Uh, it was mostly regarding sustainability and being in Chicagoland, I was kind of thinking about my footprint, like carbon footprint that was kind of top of mind. And part of what came from that is the logistics of getting food brought over to Chicago. Most of like leafy greens, for example, they take about seven days to get here. Um, so that's a lot in terms of nutrition, you kind of lose a lot of nutrition, but also it just takes so long to get here. It takes a lot of, you know, it can really increase your carbon footprint if you just buy food instead of having it produced here locally, which isn't always yeah. available because winter. But um, so what I was trying to solve for from learning from that paper um, was to, if I could just grow food for myself indoors, for my family, um, that would take a lot of the carbon footprint, actually a huge chunk of it, like the way my personal carbon footprint would go away. I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, so I, I actually found a book called Year Round Indoor Salad Gardening. I had no idea what microgreens were at the time. And I, I don't even think the author, Peter Burke, wrote the word microgreen once in that book. But it taught uh, me a technique, which is very similar to how we do traditional microgreens, where you like grow microgreens, although he has a different word for it, um, in like aluminum baking foil pans. Uh, where you just put aluminum baking foil pans, put soil, seed, and then uh, you put some kind of weight. I usually actually put just soaked paper towels. Let it grow for three days in a dark space. Then you put on your windowsill and you've got a salad in seven days. So we started doing that for just to solve this like carbon footprint thing is kind of, I was inspired by that concept. And then um, over time, um, we actually, we, we had cancer in family. My mom was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer uh, during that same period of time. And I was growing broccoli microgreens. I didn't know it at the time because I was just trying to solve like, oh, greens are good for you. That was the extent of my nutritional education at the time. Uh, but then we started learning about things like sulforaphane, where it comes from, and how beneficial microgreens are in general. I didn't realize I was growing something that was so incredible. Uh, so we started growing for the family outside of just my wife and I. And then friends were kind of interested in it. And I started getting racks and just growing a little bit more and more over time. And then it just kind of kept going from there. That's that's basically how Spear Farms was started. We were just racks in a basement growing for family. And then uh, we just kept going. I, I had a little bit of that. Uh, I was always inspired to start a business. So it, eventually I was like, well, let's try it. Let's let's see what happens with it. And uh, it just it just kept going like four or five years later. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Um, that, that That's amazing. Yeah. I, like I, I kind of had a similar journey where I didn't like start directly in my career. So I started growing like outdoors, but um, like it just the idea especially like back then where it was less common um to to be able to grow food indoors just felt like a dream you know like you can grow it in like seven to ten days you have something ready to eat it tastes really good it's it's like also like one of the top superfoods in the world um it's like it just seemed almost like too good to be true um and uh, and then like you could pair that to outdoor farming which um like, you know i live in toronto you guys live in chicago like our weather's pretty similar it's like you have pretty much six months of the year you can't grow anything um or you can't have anything to harvest i should say like things might grow but you don't have anything you can potentially sell like it's the maximum period of selling like salad greens would be like six months 
in a greenhouse, you can extend it. And there's a lot of technologies now that like, you know, you can grow year round with artificial lights in a greenhouse, uh, you know, so, so there's ways to extend the season. Um, but those start getting very expensive and aren't really practical for people that are like, you know, want to start small. Whereas like microgreens, you can start with like, you know, a pretty small, like you buy some racks, some lights, everyone lives somewhere generally, like you usually have an apartment or a house. It takes a small amount of space. It's something that's just so feasible for people to start, um, which is one of like the really nice things. I remember when I was outdoor farming before, like I saw the opportunity with microgreens, I was like, I'd love to have a greenhouse and be able to produce year round. Um, but like, I'm sure, I'm sure it's the same thing in Chicago. Like land is crazy expensive and it's like, where do you, where do you like buy land, build a greenhouse anywhere close to this, like to Chicago or Toronto and make it a viable business? Like it just, it, the numbers just don't make sense, which is why there's not a whole lot of farms in cities other than like subsidized ones or like urban farms that have more of like a nonprofit, uh, education focus, which is a great thing. Um, but like from a pure like business perspective, they they generally are difficult to make work. Whereas a microgreens business is much more doable to make work in in, in a city, which is really cool. Um, I, I'd love to hear like so you started in 2018. You just had like a small uh, setup in your home, and then it wasn't even a setup. <laughs> it was he we we had just moved into our condo. And he had gotten this idea. And next thing I know, because we didn't really own any dishes or cups or anything like that, <laughs> four of my cabinets in the kitchen had been completely taken over by germinating seeds. Um, and That'd so we didn't even have a, a rack. Idea. Yeah, we didn't even have a rack. We just had a windowsill, uh, a balcony windowsill and just like little sunflower microgreens and broccoli just growing on a windowsill in front of a sliding glass door. That's how it was. So it was the rack didn't come till I think the winter later or something like that. But we mm -hmm. spent most of the time just growing on a windowsill. I think it was in our bedroom, was it not? <laughs> it was in our bedroom. <laughs> yeah. It was in our office. I took over every single window to grow things. I was planting and harvesting every single day, um, which was viable, especially when COVID happened and we were working more remote. Yeah, uh, wasn't that bad to, to really to really do. Um, do not recommend doing blackout in your kitchen cabinets if they're made of wood. Yeah. They will, they will get damaged. <laughs> Wasn't a good idea, but it's how we learned. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just picture, I got pictured that so perfectly in my head of like, you open your kitchen cabinets and there's like these sprouts growing. Um, yeah. And it's just like, what, what a, what a cool concept, but you're totally right. If they are made out of wood. It's not going to be too long until you get mold and and the, the woods the like particle board if, if that's what's made would start expanding and stuff. Like I, I learned the hard way. <laughs> I grew in my parents' basement without a way to control humidity, and there was a lot of plants down there. And I remember like the humidity got up to seventy percent, and I was like, oh no, like this could be really bad really <laughs> soon because I know like you can get like mold growing, and that that's why a lot of these like cannabis crops like that's the biggest often issue with them you, before like it's legal in Canada now but before that like they, people would just like rent houses and just convert it to grow cannabis like uh and then those houses were like impossible to sell because they didn't want to vent the air out because of the smell so there would just be this humid air accumulating in the mold and it was like this whole thing in, in probably more in Canada than in the U.S. uh now it's really not a thing because like it's legal here so it's not really mm -hmm. an issue um but like it's the same issue where like if you start getting mold developing in your house it's pretty dangerous, but when you're growing like five, 10, 20 trays, it doesn't really become a problem. It's more when you're growing like a lot of microgreens or, or, or produce in a small amount of space that you really need a way to control the humidity. So I just remember like panicking like a weekend. It's like, how am I going to do this? Like, what do I do to control humidity? Uh, luckily I had like a really good um, uh, owner of like a hydroponic store that like guided me in so many different ways. But that was like the first thing is just how to control humidity. Cause I knew nothing, uh, you know, back then. Um, but yeah, so, yep. so that, that's kind of where you started, um, which is amazing, by the way. I love how, like, you know, you just like went in and just, we're just trying it, which I think is such a good way to do it. Um, and then where are you guys at kind of now compared to where you started at? So that was, there's, a, there's almost like three or four stops to how we did. So we started just, I'm going to call it for fun at home. And then, uh, we were, we moved to a basement, actually literally where Kate is sitting right now. And there's, there's furniture on her. It's 
parents' basement. That was literally our first actual farm where we were growing for the family because we need a larger space. We, we started growing where she is. And now it's furniture. We've obviously moved on from there. Uh, we had maybe eight to 10 racks. Um, and we had in that stage went um, to semi-automated. Um, what I mean that is we had like the smaller flood tables on, on top of the racks. And oh, cool. we were all over the place working remotely. Like, we just we were never on, always on site. So we, automation was really critical for us. Um, from there, we had moved on a few years back um, to a real estate office building, which was amazing at the beginning uh, because we had we went from like maybe 600 square feet to 800, something like that, growing in where Kate is physically um, to about 1800 to oh, wow. which is about 1000 to grow and 800 for production, which is still really tiny. But it was like amazing. We were so, so excited about it at the time um, and we were able to get up to, I don't know, about 600 trade capacity there, somewhere in that range. It started getting challenging and we could probably do more, but it started getting challenging with climate control and in, yeah. in that space it was a big thing for us. And I didn't want to invest into all the ex like exhaust fans, demon fire, like all those things in that space particular, because I knew we were going to move. Um, and then the last two months, we just moved into a 5,000 square foot warehouse. So it's wow. been so much easier. <laughs> so we were like Pac-Man in like a, a thousand square foot grow space where we have we have these those four by eight foot flood tables and there were five shelves high, but they were all like three feet away from each other. So it was like Pac-Man. You're walking this way, you have to make a sharp turn and you gotta move a rack around uh to you know the next row or something. It was it was incredibly hard just to operate in there. So it's so nice to have breathing space. It's so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First of all, congratulations. That's incredible. I didn't realize how Thank large you. of a facility you just moved into. I know we we obviously were talking before the podcast and, and I knew you guys were moving into a new facility, but that's incredible. That's like that that's a that's a good size space. Like that's that gives you a lot of room to grow, especially like, you know, from eight hundred square feet to, to five thousand. That's like a, a good jump. So you and, and I and I totally agree. Like one thing, so uh, we had uh, like a 20, I think it was like 2,300 square foot, the first like commercial unit we got. And we filled that up in a few years. And by the end, it was so tight that like, you know, I started hiring employees by that point that like, you know, like, yeah, you're right. Like Pac-Man where it's like, you're kind of, it, for me, it was like Tetris where we had to move like the germination racks in like a certain order to be able to walk through the space. Um, so it just started <laughs> getting more and more uh, uncomfortable. I almost like like I'm not claustrophobic, but like it starts getting that way when you have like this demand for product and you need to keep growing more product where you have the same size space. It's just like you're building more stuff, but then you have like this limited limited space. I remember thinking about like, is this good for employees? That was like when the shift started happening where it was like, OK, yeah, this works for me. But is this going to work for like having employees? And that was when the shift started happening that I started thinking about, OK, like people need space. They can't be like crammed in. Uh, so, so the, the next unit we bought was, was larger. And then we, we had two units beside each other, which was pretty much 5,000 square feet as well. And with that amount of space, there was so much like wiggle room, you know, like it, it wasn't super tight. So, um, I'm glad you guys have upgraded and, and have a bigger space. I'm sure you're going to fill it up. Uh, would be my guess, but, um, it, it'll take some, some time. And, and this, and that's like a lot of growing space. So, um, that's amazing. I'd love to hear kind of like, uh, yeah, like who, who you're like, what type of customers you have and, and the process of, um, yeah, the process of like getting a new customer, what your kind of market is and yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we started most, I think followed like what every single Mike Kareen's farm does and that the methodology, like, it, like as you scale, these things start to look a bit different, but I we started First, like everyone else, direct consumer. Growing microgreens, dropping it off at their door. Um, and farmers markets, probably that's how you acquired most of your customers. Um, that works, but it's very, very challenging to scale. Like suddenly mm -hmm. you're doing like 200 some drop offs a week, you're managing customer support, and you're carrying a 60 pound, you know, uh, thing of dirt when someone's calling you. Just <laughs> managing all that was, that was, it was stressful. Um, it was a little bit too much. So we we uh, transitioned off of direct consumer and got some help with, uh, there's a local food agri that actually was able to assist us with that. We were really thankful for that uh, because it was it was just incredibly uh, challenging. Um, so we're kind of 
in this transition away from direct consumer. Uh, but at the same time, we were also servicing restaurants directly um, as well. And it always like logically made sense to me where if you're doing direct consumer, drop off to restaurants on the same route. And that worked for a period of time um, as well. And we, we still service restaurants today. Uh, but we're starting to, now that we have space, um, we're starting to look at more uh, working with distributors or larger uh, customers like grocery store chains. Uh, to your point you mentioned earlier, you bottleneck on what your sales capacity can do when you are in a small space. Like we yeah. were, we weren't full, but I couldn't land the customers I would have loved to work with like one big customer. Yeah. It just, you, you have this like chicken or egg problem. So we got the warehouse and um, now we've, we've had a few opportunities come up to work with some uh, distributors and things are kind of Amazing. all moving in, in parallel at the same time as we're building this warehouse and uh, we're working with distributors. It's, it's been exciting, really, really exciting to be able to work with them. It's far uh, easier for me to kind of focus on just the farming problem and not just farming and sales and customer support. I, yeah. We're, we spent, uh, it's not, we don't nail it completely this year, but we've simplified our business a lot. We were doing so many different channels and uh, they came with so many different pain points and so little sleep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. Like, like I think, like it, it, it's it's just a learning process, right? Like you're always learning when when running a business, and um, like a pretty common theme that I see is like people grow a lot of crops, like they'll want to grow everything because they're so excited, and then they'll kind of reduce it down. Um, but it's also cool to hear uh, on on the on like the sales front of of having like a wider variety of customer types and then kind of narrowing it down as you see what works best for you guys. And there is like, there's no right answer, right? Like some, like you could in theory, if you really want to scale direct to consumer, it's just going to be logistically a lot of work. So some, most people that get into microgreens want to farm. So the, the more you let other people or, or your customers deal with the logistics side, the more you can actually spend just growing the product. Um, so distributors kind of let you do that because you don't have to do really much sales with them, like maybe a promotion here and there, grocery stores as well. Um, whereas like restaurants and then especially direct to consumer, you constantly need a new flow of these type of customers because restaurants change their menu or they go to business or new ones open up and then direct to consumer, like they'll go on vacation in the summer or, um, you know, they're just like, Hey, I'm, I've had this for a few months and I, I'm getting tired of it or something. Whereas grocery stores, you always have like an inflow distributors. You always have an inflow of new customers. So you don't have to like really do that process as much. Um, have you found yeah. switching more in that route has taken, like allowed you guys to have more time to focus on production rather than logistics? Definitely yeah, restaurants and distribution, I think, are probably the big two. Um, just because it, I think what it comes down to is what problems do you want to work on and solve, to your point. Yeah. Um, like, I can work on a lot of what way we handled our, our business was through our website. I, I have a server that helps automate a lot of the business. And um, the website was functional. Not great. It still, it still is not great. I have to spend some time with it. But... I, this is not really my background necessarily. I don't want to sit and learn web development to make the process of, you know, having somebody place an order and those kind of subscription or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it just like, I, I didn't have the bandwidth to really sit down and focus on that problem at the time. So that, that was also another inspiration for why I would want it to move away from um, direct to consumer and focus mostly on restaurant distribution. But also it's, it's much easier to hit, um, like you have lower margins with uh these places often on the product itself yeah but um the margins for like labor is it's just much easier because you're dropping off to one place instead of 50 places and yeah. you don't have to worry about situations where uh we, when we did a lot of direct to consumer it was zip code based and so some zip codes are humongous and you can have when you're starting a new area you can have maybe two customers and it'll be on the opposite side of a zip code that's 20 miles apart slight exaggeration but that's what it felt like yeah so. yeah <laughs> not too far off though <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you're, you're, you're in a major city, so it, may, it makes it a little easier because you have a large population base but I, I totally agree like you know you could you could spend a lot of time just on deliveries uh with direct to consumer like it, that could be like a full-time job for a staff um, you know, for one staff potentially, or sometimes more, right? And, and you become more of a logistics uh, uh, company. Uh, the more you do like small orders versus large orders and less of a, not less of a farm, but like 
percentage of your time actually growing the food will as a whole of the business will become less. So um, that's just something to consider as well. But I think there's a reason most people start with the direct to consumer. It's easier to get the customers. Um, there's lower risk. Uh, it, it, the size of your operation matches it really well. So like if someone tried to go <clears throat> to like Cisco on the first day of having a micro farm, <laughs> like they're like, yeah, we, and, and let's assume in, in an ideal world, they're like, yes. Um, how do you grow? Like if they're like, hey, we want a thousand clamshells of like pea shoots every week on Fridays and it's just you or like you and like, like you two or something, right? Like, how do you, how do you do that? Um, and then all of a sudden this opportunity that's there, you, you've, you've let this customer down. And then when you go back in the future, they might be less interested in actually working with you. So there's a risk and there's how many Cisco's are there? There's like us food, Cisco's, there's maybe a few other, but there's really not that many of these like massive distributors. Now I'm not saying that's like the best route to take, but just as an example, like that's the extreme scenario of like trying to sell like a Cisco or like a Walmart or Whole Foods, like those type of places where um, there's limited number of them. Uh, it, it's much, it's unreal. Like, I don't think it's really realistic to get a sale like that. But even if you did, how do you manage everything that you don't know anything about because you're just started out? So I, I think it makes sense to start with direct to consumer, but um, I've seen it myself and I've seen it with a lot of farms that have gone through the process that you guys have gone through and are going through. And it seems that you just move up the ladder of the type of customer. Um, and then the really large scale farms pretty much only sell through distributors. And then they're a hundred percent focused on how to make the product better. How do I create new products? How do I like make the process as efficient as possible? And that's where the focus is not as much legit, like very little on logistics. Um, yeah. 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 I, I completely agree. I think that as like the journey itself was tremendous for us. It's, it's so, so important. Um, just there's a difference between growing 20 trays and growing hundred trays and 200 and 300. There's the inputs change your environment changes to your point. Humidity earlier changes so significantly over time and doing it, it took us like years to get to the point where like watching that change happen over time and learning what farming indoors actually means. Um, direct consumer enabled that for us. Like we just, didn't know any better. It just at scale be becomes very, very challenging. I loved doing farmers markets. I have one tomorrow. I do them every single week. I've been doing it for like uh, th three years, I think, since COVID started. Every single weekend, um, because it also is a way to like you directly interacting with the customers. You get to understand about the product quality and detail, but you also learn about what the uh, what your sales pitch is like what is the micro yeah. green just being able to say that doing it over and over and over again and messing up over and over and over again and then figuring out what works and what doesn't was so so critical just that routine so i completely agree i think small scale direct consumer is is the path but you have to really like focus on that one thing if you want to do it at scale because it is it becomes quite challenging there's a lot to it yeah uh kate do you go to the farmer's market with chris or is that something that chris kind of takes on himself at this point at this point he takes it on himself i used to run uh the sunday market because when it when we were still i mean we are still very scrappy but back in the day when we were trying to get restaurants he would just go out on sundays i'd load him up with a bag of samples and he'd go to the city and i would have to work our sunday market it's not something that i do so much anymore obviously i can cover but um i I, when it comes to what, like our, our split as far as like responsibilities at the farm, I do probably 95% of the farming. Um, so like, I don't really, I, I'm involved in the sales. I mostly, cause I know all the inventory like memorized. <laughs> so a lot of those questions just come back to me, but the farmer's market is not anything that I really do anymore. Um, but I did. And it was like, I had fun doing it in the sense that like, yeah, you kind of, um, you get to interact that face to face time is really, really nice. And it's actually through that, that we ended up introducing a lot of the different varieties that we probably grow today. And now I'm trying to simplify away cause it was just too much, but, yeah. um, yeah, it's like, it's nice when you are in that D to C or, you know, um, focus with customers that, you know, you get to learn their needs and wants and try to maneuver around that. Um, but as we've kind of moved away, not moved away, but like our focus has shifted in a sense. So it's, um, it's harder to meet that. Like, I want this. Well, I, I don't have the room for this. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Saying, saying no more often um, becomes one easier. And I think you recognize what is really realistic for the business. Um, I think at the beginning, it's, it's easy to say yes, because you're like, oh, I can get a sale with like this restaurant that wants uh, Sherville, but there's like no one else that really wants that except for this one restaurant as an example, you know, I'm sure there's definitely farms that, you know, grow Sherville and, and, you know, can make good money and, and do volume at it. But just in general, like that's an example of, of like where people kind of start cutting down on those type of crops um, if they just don't have enough of a market for it. Um, so you, Kate, you do most of the production, it sounds like, and then Chris, you focus more on like sales um, and, and then like what, what other kind of like you do the farmer's market, what, what's kind of your role in the, in the business at this point? Yeah, it's, I think, well, more recently it's become, I think, more split. I've been doing some more of the operations at the farm um, just because as we scaled, we haven't hired just because, I mean, we're investing so much into the space, new shelving and lights. So I've been more hands-on with the farm more recently, but traditionally my role has been more of, uh, yeah, it's, it's just case point sales. Um, I run a lot of the technology behind the farm. Uh, what I mean by that is um, I have a server um, that I have running routine jobs to automate a lot of the functions of the farm. Awesome. Uh, particularly, um, like we had a website for direct to consumer, get an order in that tells team to plant said order. And so it'll be ready for, you know, whenever uh, it's finished growing. Um, automating that piece, automating the piece of um, like what the team needs to plant, what the team needs to, like uh, what the inputs in from harvest so we know what our yields are so that way we know what our future planting is, uh, needs to be. Uh, kind of things like that, a lot of technology behind that, as well as I'm trying to, right now I'm, as we're building out the farm, I'm actually trying to scale up or think about how we develop the farm a little bit differently than what we did in the past. Uh, we had, um, maybe 20 racks and I'm including like some that are like four by eight feet or the taller, larger ones as well in that, uh, total. And now we're, it's going to go from 600 tray ish to somewhere in the two thousands, uh, at max capacity. And we have shelving that is 12 feet uh, tall. So like, I don't like, we, I need the ladder to get up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it, it comes with this challenge of like, where is everything? You have to you have to have a digital footprint of what your farm actually yeah. has and where are things ready when you say like hey we need to cut 12 broccoli today where where is it <laughs> so i'm trying to solve for that problem and i've been working a lot of uh tech different technologies to put that together uh i have an idea on how i'm going to build it i've actually started working on it but i haven't completed set project uh so things like that are kind of like we're I mainly, uh, what I mostly spend my time thinking about outside of just trying to uh, sell the product. Uh, but yeah, what we're seeing, like, I think uh, I spend a lot of time with the harvesting I help out with. I think Kate and team is mostly focused on planting. I, I don't think I contribute too much in that area. And then I have been, because I'm also thinking about that, 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 uh, that, um, like where to put stuff, like making a foot, digital footprint or a farm, I have also been the one that's kind of, doing all of the taking trace from germination to putting them to light for watering, et cetera, um, and putting it so they're automated on the shelves. Uh, because I had to also take into consideration what's the humidity and temperature in those like microclimates as yeah. well, just kind of learning what our environment is. So I think I put all like 99% of like the plants to light over the last two months just to learn and understand what happens. As mm -hmm. well, like, I get to see what happens when I put them on the shelf and then when I take them off as well for harvesting too, just uh, so I can like you learn in real time and very quickly and rapidly yeah. what the problems are. And it's paid off tremendously. We moved into this farm, our yields are kind of weak. Uh, it was just, we learned it was just simply too cold. I didn't have all my sensors here right away. Uh, to like, uh, we iterated week over week over week and our yields have just started skyrocketing. We've been super happy. A lot of the issues we had were resolved, not hundred percent perfect, but been pretty happy with the progress we've made recently. It's been, it, it's made life a lot easier. <laughs> All that to say, like, I literally couldn't do anything that I'm able to do on a day to day without him having automated and developing everything. When I, I didn't actually start, you know, with the business with him right away, I didn't come mm -hmm. on till much later. And I point blank, we were still hand watering at the time. And I pretty much point blank said to him, I was like, if you can't figure out how to automate this, I'm not going to be hand watering every single day. <laughs> and so, um, like as, you know, as, as time goes on, our roles will shift back and forth or, you know, uh, but he's definitely more hands-on 
today, but I anticipate that as he yeah. works more through business development, it'll be back probably. Yeah. But yeah, again, I love the tech part. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, want, I can just sit there and do it all day. It's part of why I like, I love working distributors is like, I really like working on technology. Like a lot of my background is more like database and data analytics and data science and those kind of things. And I just, I like doing it. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's important to, to, to do what, what you like in your business, you know, like you obviously have to do things that you, it may not be your favorite. Like that's just part of life. Like whether you have a job or you run a business, that's just part of it. Like, I, I think there's very few people that have a job where they don't or have a business where there's things that they have like, like excited a hundred percent of the stuff to do. Uh, but having said that, like the more you can move towards doing the things you like, the more sustainable it is as a business, because that means like you're enjoying it more. And the more you enjoy it, the more you can do it for longer periods of time. So that's like the methodology is like, if there's things that you don't enjoy, if it's something that you feel is a weakness in yourself, and you want to develop, that's one thing. And it makes sense to practice it, to develop it. For example, like, sales. I'm guessing when you started, Chris, at the farmer's market, your strategy you have now is way different than when you started because you've practiced and developed that skill. But there's other things like administrative stuff. Some people may just be like, that's not of interest to me. I want to find a way to automate it or hire someone to do that kind of work as an example. Um, and then you be you enjoy your job more and you'd be some, I, I've learned in, in uh, with my farm, you'd be shocked at like finding out what people really enjoyed. Like we had staff that were like, I love doing Excel spreadsheets and I'm like, you love doing Excel <laughs> spreadsheets and like, without asking, I would have never known or without having that conversation. So um, it's often surprising what people really do enjoy. And it's every human is so different that like you could just find ways to utilize what they really enjoy as well and build uh, around that as much as possible. And then uh, it becomes a, just a more sustainable uh, business. Just uh, uh, something I, I figured I'd mention is we used, um, uh, Vertigro's like automate, automated watering system and the like software hardware combo. And one thing that was, that was really nice, um, was that like you put the crop in, you press start, it does all the automated watering lights, fans sort of thing. But when you're ready, the, when it's harvest day, you can print out a sheet and it'll say, take eight trays from this level. So you just like uh, organize it that way. So it automates that side of things, whether you want to do that yourself or buy a pre-made thing like, like Vertigo's farmware totally up to you, but it's totally doable. And it just makes it a lot more scalable for when you have staff. So like you can just get them print out the sheet. These are all the trays you need to harvest. They don't need to guess, oh, is this one ready yet? Where do I get these trays from? It's all in like an automated system. So um, that that exists or you can develop it. Um, but like that's, I think a, was really helpful for us because before we did that, I had to be at the farm and like certain, we had two harvests a week. So some crops would be like amaranth. It would be not that big of a difference you could tell between like the Monday harvest and the Thursday harvest. So sometimes people would take the wrong trays and we get lower yields. Um, so, so something as simple as that is like you have it in the system. You print out this harvest sheet that's auto autom automatically populated for you. The staff have it. They can check off. Okay, I took that. I took that. I took that. And it just makes it a lot easier to prevent any uh, harvest uh, kind of mistakes, which can be pretty common, especially when you have, like you said, like up to 2000 trays, it's pretty easy, uh, to confuse trays for other trays, uh, at that kind of volume for sure. Good to know. I, I'll, I will check it out. Honestly, I just haven't been exposed to it. I, 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 I'm, I'm just trying to figure out these problems in real time. And yeah, I, for sure. I always think about how I'm going to build it, how I'm going to add it to my system. I, I don't even look to see what's out there. <laughs> yeah, the way I like, there's definitely things I, like I had to custom make a tray, a tray washer because the like uh, the bootstrap one didn't exist back then. You know, like that's something like very new. Um, so the, like the tray washers from Europe uh, are meant for like large scale farms. They're two forty volt. They cost like back then they were like forty thousand dollars. Like it was nuts. Um, so yeah. now bootstrap has one that's I don't know what it is like thirty like $4,000 or something plus the, the, uh, the, the pressure wash or something around that. So like a solution that was once $40,000, you had to custom make to get something in like ours was about 10,000. Um, you can get for half of that now and not have to do any work at all. So the way I always think of it, if there's a solution that exists, depending obviously on the cost, right? Like that 40,000 one didn't make sense. Cause it's just the return doesn't make sense. But if, if there's a piece of equipment or automation that you can, purchase that is cost effective for you, your time can be then spent on like getting more sales, which will develop the business in a more efficient way. Because if you can spend like, let's say it takes you 40 hours, which is pretty low, but let's just say it takes you 40 hours to develop something and test it and do all that stuff. 
that 40 hours in sales can go a long way in taking the business further. So that's just like my frame that I've switched to over time is like, if there's a solution that exists, it's cost effective. It usually makes sense to, or, or I, I think it's, it's a good thing to at least consider buying something um, rather than building it because building it usually takes a lot longer and that time can be better utilized elsewhere. So if you do like a cost benefit analysis of those type of decisions, but you're right, if you don't know about it, how are you supposed to like, you know, find something, right? So that's that's where the, the part of the challenge is, is like when you're so busy, which you guys are developing the farm, you don't really have as much time to like research what's actually available um, and what would be a good actual solution for different problems you have um, in the business. So um, just figured I'd, I'd mention that. Um, Thank you. And, it's, it's so good to know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, in, in terms of uh, staff, are you uh, do you guys have any staff yet? Or are you managing it all on your own at this point? It's it's mostly just us. Um, we have help with driving, and we have family helping out, uh, and it's been tremendous with doing things like uh, you talked about the uh, the bootstrap, like the the tray pressure washer. My my uncle just like built <laughs> built one, like a no like just very completely homemade. Not it is not fancy. He made it <laughs> out of a grill. He drilled and holes into the bottom pressure washer oh. and on top, and. Um, it's functional and we're still working on some version 1.1 needs to be built, but it's functional. Like you could do it out of anything. It'd be so cost effective. Cool. <laughs> Fortunate to have family to help us out with a lot of these things, especially when we, when we fall behind, you know, life happens. You just, yeah, I didn't fill enough trays this week. Uh, stuff like that. Um, we have, we have some help. Amazing. <laughs> that, that's really cool. I love that idea. That's, um, because like really the, the, like a tray washer, uh, obviously if you get one freshly made, it's got all the testing and, and it's, it's going to obviously like, it's going to work better. Like even the custom made yeah. one we have, it wasn't perfect because it was custom made. Like it's a one-off solution. It's a lot harder to make it, uh, uh, work really well. For example, like the first seating machine that, uh, that the prototype we made, if like, we just gave that to someone to use, uh, it, it would work, but it wouldn't be like something that would make sense to use long-term probably not. So it's the same thing with like custom made things. There's a bit of a gamble there. You can't really like return something custom made, you know, as an example. So like the tray washer worked and it worked pretty well. Like I'd give it like an eight out of 10, which is pretty good. Like it got the job done, but, um, it like, sometimes we had to put the tray through twice and we learned the techniques and there was like a gap where we couldn't fit a tray in. So we'd have to wait for the <laughs> conveyor belt to go. Um, so just like things like that, that would add up over time to make it make sense to buy like an actual out of the box solution uh, because you'd have to not only make like version one, but you have, then you have to make version two. But in this case scenario, you have families always like the best, <laughs> like, you know, because they put in the effort in a way that like, it's going to be hard for staff to do something like that. Um, but I love the idea of using something like that. Cause the hardest part is really the container of a tray washer. Like you can take a pressure washer, uh, split the nozzles, put them in different spots and then like just push it through um again it's not going to be perfect but it's still way faster and way cleaner than washing by hand which i'm sure you guys have done plenty of in, in your farming <laughs> career no I, I don't know a single person that likes tray washing by hand we love it <laughs> we <laughs> uh, kate has um, taken the brunt of that more recently yeah, yeah I imagine that's uh the, 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 like i've seen like some of our staff have done some cool things like there was someone that put a uh, like one of those like phone holders around the tray washer, put some uh, some pallets, and then sat high enough and just watched movies pushing the trays through. So once you have a, <laughs> a tray washer or like things like that, it it's there's more benefits than people think of, which is like oh it's going to be faster or it's going to do a better job. But there's also things like uh, it's more foolproof for the staff and the staff have a better enjoyment of life. Or you guys, whoever's doing the work, um, you know. If you'd rather like get soaking wet, be cold, have dirt all over you washing trays or sit and watch movies, pushing a, a tray through like a machine and just like relaxing, like, you know, eating lunch while you're washing trays sort of thing. You know, it's a very different <laughs> experience. Um, and I, I wish for all my green farms to be able to experience both because I think it's good to have know what you started with and what you can build. <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> you know that's one of the things i'm most excited about this move but uh being in a larger warehouse is that right now i mean it's filling trays with 
to imagine filling 2000 trays a week with dirt. That's it's, it's kind of insanity or cleaning all those trays at the same time. So you could fill up with dirt. It's a lot. So, yeah. um, what I'm, I'm really excited to be able to do to exactly what you just said is, um, put in the equipment so that way we can auto, not automate, but, uh, s- simplify how we fill trays with soil and uh, dirt. We're very fortunate with the family members. We're just all like, Hey, they saw us, they saw us mostly Kate cleaning trays with a hose, you know, at the time, um, just to get the dirt off of it. And it's like, this is the solution they provided to us, which a lot of it looks like it's, it's, it's just a different way of doing the bootstrap farmer, you know, pressure yeah. washer system. Yeah. yeah. But it's literally a grill. We were just thankful to have the help. <laughs> that, that, I love that because like there's lots of people that maybe at a smaller scale and don't have four thousand dollars or five thousand dollars to buy a tray washer, you know? <laughs> so if like if you have an old grill or you can probably find one on marketplace pretty pretty cheap, um, you know, like it, 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 it's a pretty good setup. You just have to like do some cutouts for the for the tray to go through and then cutouts for the 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 nozzles and just do some experimenting with it you know again it's it's like i think at the beginning most migrants farms have more time and are less willing to spend more money and then as time goes on it becomes the opposite where like time really becomes your limiting factor and then you're willing to spend the money because like you don't have the, the time anymore to to develop things um and, and you also i think people often realize like how valuable their time as the business owner is um, I think uh, when you start out, like I probably valued my time at like $15 an hour when I calculated things. And I'm like, if I look back, my time was worth way more because if I can spend it on sales and hire someone for 20 bucks an hour to do the labor, like how much more efficient and how much faster could I grow and make the operation better? And 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 just having it in that frame uh, can be can be helpful to, um, you know, to to early microgreen growers that are kind of starting out that um, are kind of basing it on like the cost to replace them rather than the value of themselves in the business. Um, and that, that changes over time as I'm, I'm sure you guys have experienced, like you see yourselves as a very important, valuable part of the business. Um, and the more that time goes on, and, and, like I just imagine you guys growing 2000 trays uh, doing that, uh, you know, you, you'll want you'll want to have automation or staff or a combination of both uh, to just have a good quality of life to manage. That's that's a lot. It's a lot to manage for sure. <laughs> I remember our first big upgrade was just getting the uh, the harvester. Nice. The, okay. Amazing. That, I think we put off a lot of stuff just because. I mean, hopefully Chris will attest to this. I, I was just so fast at everything. And was able to pump through everything that he was like. Well, why would I spend the money? I'm mm-hmm. just gonna break your back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> she's so fast it's insane <laughs> how fast she is like literally i granted like i'm not doing this as, as uh, all the activities as much as her but she'll clean trays in like milliseconds it feels like and i will spend like, in comparison like a minute and those are exaggerations but it's like it's <laughs> yeah. it's so fast yeah. Yeah. The, the, the the first upgrade it was once we f- figured out how to actually grow microgreens to be able to use that correctly, yeah. which was the big hump. Um, once that was the first big upgrade. And so just having that time back and cutting down our harvesting, God knows how long hours. And so as I, as we, you know, move into this bigger space and think about what are other automations or things that can make our lives easier. I, I do think back to like, Oh, when we got the harvester, life was easier yeah. and so even though our tray washer is prototype v1 and it, out of a grill i look forward to what v2 is going to look like next week when we change some oh, nice. things up and, <laughs> and, and and we just shove trays through the thing or we get a something that just fills dirt because as yeah. we're staring down like these new accounts or things that as you know i can't sit there and fill two thousand trays i have a farm you know, we're still growing. Like these yeah. things don't stop. I think like that's one of the hardest things was remembering too. Like we didn't stop production when we moved the warehouse. So to the warehouse. So we were still growing in our old space, growing in the new space, doing everything in two different places. So I look forward to having the automation and va- getting my time back yeah. <laughs> more than anything to just continue to work on like growing better microgreens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also for, for a big, a big benefit I, I see with automation is, um, the consistency that it, like, for example, if like a lot of 
farms are very hesitant to switch to automated watering because uh, you know some crops can be more sensitive to like amounts of water. Um, and, and but like at the same time, uh, if you're if you are reliant on if the business is reliant on you uh, to do these type of tasks in the long term, then like what happens if uh, like you get sick or you want to take vacation? Like it, it makes it a lot harder to where, whereas like if you have an on make wiring system, all you got to do is tell someone to like turn a valve or press a button. Um, it's a lot easier to teach them that and the same thing with the harvester. It's a lot easier to teach them how to harvest with the harvester than it is to cut by hand. Um, and then same thing with seeding machines, soil machines, like all of it makes it a lot easier to train staff and get the consistency as you guys uh, roles in the business evolve and change to be less doing the day to day and more running the business from like a bird's eye view. If that's what you want to do in the long run, um, then then it just makes it a lot easier to to like actually transition that because um, I've heard so many times from farms that like the watering um, they don't want to they, they're the only one that wants to do it because it's so sensitive um, and like that works but like is that a long-term solution maybe maybe if that if, if someone wants to be involved in the business day to day seven days a week for the foreseeable future but if you want to switch to a model where like you can go away for two weeks and not have to worry because like it's all set up for you guys, you guys or anyone that that's in this micro space. Uh, that's what I see is how you get your freedom uh, and time to, to not, like, you know, I think most people love what they do, but at a certain point, like there's many other hobbies and interests that people want to do um, that micro can uh, allow with the proper automation and systems in place. And it sounds like you guys are moving in that direction, which is, uh, amazing to hear because uh, it's going to give you like a really great lifestyle with a, a really great business at the same time. Yeah, I completely agree. Completely, completely agree. I think automation is key. There's there's no work life balance <laughs> until you've done you've gone through a lot of the automations. Uh, it's well at scale, it's smaller, it's a little yeah. bit simpler. But I uh, I think it also comes down to a lot of testing as well. Yes, because. Um, I think what uh, the the types of seeds you can get, you can get broccoli, 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 bad broccoli, and then suddenly your systems just fall apart because the seed lot or something is just off for some reason. Um, I think testing will be a really key part of that too. We, I, I think everybody kind of does some testing, just kind of naturally happens. Um, but at a larger scale, that's when things become a little bit more sensitive to like you have to know what you're going to get for the germination and what the yields are going to come out of these things ahead of time before you put it into these systems because bad things could happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and like just people don't realize if you're growing like just when the time comes, you're growing 2000 trays. If you get a yield increase of 1%, that's a lot of extra potential revenue, right? So like like the, the, like at scale, the, 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 the precision becomes more important because the like, you know, if you can get your yields up 1%, 2%, 3%, like, all of a sudden that that's all it like gets usually like pure profit at like those those like kind of improvements um and at scale like one small change can make a really big difference to the financials of the business which is really great uh it go, obviously goes both ways like you know it a one percent decrease is the same same uh challenge there uh or, or opportunity and challenge combination there but um yeah like people may not realize how much of a difference, like optimizing those type of things as you scale can have. And it comes with time. Like it's just the more you run the business, the more you learn those type of things, how to do that, how to prevent like outbreaks of disease and, and pests and that sort of thing. Um, but I guess on that topic, do you guys run into many issues with like Pythium or, or other uh, diseases in your farm? Or is it pretty like you guys have a good system and process with that at this point? Um comes and goes i think i think we're pretty good right now okay did you want to add in oh no i was just thinking through like just the different things that we were saying i didn't actually have anything to say sorry <laughs> <laughs> well so in terms of pests and uh diseases it comes and goes um i think a lot of it for us was less pythium based and more environment based um mm -hmm. as you moved into a larger warehouse there are a lot more opportunities for microclimates and yeah. we noticed things like our basil just, just it loves the hotter temperature just wasn't doing performing as well and it was, since it wasn't performing uh, as well we saw a little bit more disease there um so like it it, it kind of comes with those we recently have adjusted our 
uh, and really temperature humidity were probably the biggest factors for us more than anything else as we adapted to the new climate and it just eliminated 99 percent of our problems um we made some we got some new lights uh more uh they're still barina but they're they're full spectrum compared to those uh cheaper t5 lights that are uh, commonly used as well love them i think that was a major major upgrade for us because we we're going to start playing with uh flowers uh kind of yeah. month so I, I really wanted to get the lights ahead of time and just kind of do some testing on it um at first we ran into some issues uh with those because we felt that it stunted summer plants growth it could have been it, the temperature and humidity as well just wasn't yeah. optimal at the time too so there's too many things going on and i didn't yeah. have full visibility sensor wise data wise um but we um as we figured these things out, the light the lights seem to have like some of the plants grow like they just weren't growing tall enough simply because I think they were getting sufficient light. Uh, little things that I, like, I, we don't want it to stretch, but we want it to yeah. get a little bit taller so you can get the harvester to do its thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, even improvements in light cause some challenges uh, for us. But yeah, it's it just you, you just need so much data. It's it's so hard to understand what causes the issues until yeah. like you have all the sensors in place. Pythium is one. I'm not sure if there's even something in place for to to kind of measure outside of just looking for damp off. But I feel that in our new environment, that has been a much easier problem for us to solve. Like we really haven't had a lot of uh, Pythium related issues. I don't, I don't, I don't think we have. It, it was a little bit more challenging in our old environment as we were kind of exploding out of the space. We're just, yeah. over, we were out of it. Uh, it was just hard to control climates and things like that. And so we started seeing a little bit more of that. And you traditionally see that in things like, like I noticed it a lot in beets or arugula, the more sensitive ones. Amaranth, I took a break from. I'm so tired of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a tough one. stressful one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as we moved here, it's it's been so much easier. But we, yeah. it's really just the sensors i have sensors for temperature and humidity Amazing. and yeah once we have that in place it was, like i saw it, it really easy to solve so, oh just make some slight tweaks and you, it was easy to solve for and I think awesome. because i think because of two we're turning trays over so quickly is another part of it like i don't think we have anything majority that sits more than seven days at this point uh, uh -huh. it's mostly you start seeing things at least in my experience as we grow like longer term girls like shiso uh yeah. Uh, when we do grow like more petite looking basil or sorrel is another one where I think in the past we have seen it. And I think maybe even just a little bit as we've adjusted to the different climate, but it is, like I said, we don't keep stuff like we're constantly rotating the shelves every, I mean, we turn it over one shelf twice in a week. So I, it's, it's can be like, I, I don't even see it all the time if it is happening either. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's like, it, it's, it's from my, what I've seen, I don't know of any farm that's like long term, like completely removed and kept pithing out. It, it tends to just come, come in. Um, but the biggest thing I've noticed, especially in like the consulting I, I do is like when people get an outbreak, it's usually because temperature and humidity is increasing. So like I've seen it because we like w one of our units, we undersize the AC a lesson learned, you know, like don't, don't cheap out when you're moving into a commercial space on like HVAC. Um, and, and so like, as we built up capacity in that space, it was a lot harder to control the, like when you have that many lights on and it's hot outside and you have, uh, your fridge on and everything else producing heat, um, your, like the AC doesn't keep up. And then also the humidity, um, is hard to keep at a level that's like closer to 50%. Uh, so that's where, uh, I've seen, with many farms, disease like will just can ravage a, a, a farm in, in with the wrong environment. So it's not always like um, coming coming directly from seed. That's the issue, and then all of a sudden you get an outbreak from that. It could just be like all it takes is like a few you know specks of pathogen, uh, and then the right environment, and then they just bloom. It's 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 just nature, you know. That's just how nature tends to work. You see it in animals and. Uh, in specific types of like plants that grow uh, in certain times of year and all like it's just if the environment is right it'll take over so try to create the environment that's best for the plants not best for, for disease and you'll have less of it um, and yeah in a bigger space it's it, at the beginning it's way easier to control humidity because you have more airspace it's like I used to have fish tanks as a kid and like when you have one of those small fish tanks uh, it, things can vary a lot more the bigger volume uh, and area you have of water like a lake versus like a bathtub, the longer it's going to take for the for variations to happen. Um, so same thing with air. Air is even faster 
uh, like humidity and temperature can change way faster than water can. So yeah, just something for people to, to think about. Um, I'd love to hear like, uh, you know, obviously you, you've had a lot of success and I can imagine there's also challenges in, in, in running uh, a business at this scale. Um, if you could just like wave a magic wand and just instantly solve a business challenge, that would just make your life a lot easier. What, what issue or specific issue you think you would want to resolve? Sure. Um, I think for me, it's, um, simplification of, uh, getting connected with the right people like uh, for the sales channels. I think it's, it's probably one that's shared by almost everybody. It's, it's not always the easiest thing to, uh, when you have no, uh, connections in, within an industry to find the right people to like show this product and, uh, get in front of the right way. It, it can take months. And sometimes I've had years, yeah. it took me three years to get into some of the, to work with some of the customers that I have today. So that would alleviate a lot of stress for me just to be able to get right in front of the right person. Um, I think that's one of the biggest pain points. There's, there's a million others, but all, a lot of them, I think like you, I feel like you need to suffer through the journey a little bit to get good at some things, uh, to nail some things like they need that growth a little bit. Yeah. Um, maybe this is the same thing for me where like, oh, it's so easy to get in front of, you know, meet distributors too, but I'm not there yet. I still need to grow. <laughs> for sure. I think um, my, I agree with him because there, there. When it comes to this stuff, there's not a ton. Like they're immediate, like an immediate interface with somebody who's doing microgreens in your general area doesn't exist, and at least for our our, our particular situation. But my answer is going to vary probably just because I do a lot of the grunt work. But if someone could just clean the flood tables for me, yeah, that would be incredible <laughs> because that is a pain in the butt <laughs> as far as breaking down all the plumbing and sanitizing and cleaning. I just want that done for me. <laughs> yeah. I totally understand that. Yeah. <laughs> like, trays are one thing, but flood tables are another one to, to be honest. I didn't clean them very often. Like there was a buildup of soil in ours and like, which sounds like, like, oh, why, like, is that, would that be good? And no, but uh, we, we grew, or, we grew organically and we found that like, it didn't, ha like it, it might've created like its own microcosm of good bacteria, like an ecosystem and that like thin layer of soil. Um, and it would just like give a little bit of that biology into the plants. You know, we, we definitely had Pythium, so it, it wasn't like, you know, it was just very specific really to Amaranth. Everything else was 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 uh, st strong enough to, to handle it. Um, and, and that comes down to often like the soil plus the lights combination. Um, but yeah, like like uh, I, 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 I agree. I, I was actually, I recorded a video at a, um, a large, they used to be a, the biggest migraines farm in the world at one point. Um, but they, they do lettuce mostly now and they have like a vat, like they have a custom made, like giant vacuum system because they're flood, they're in a greenhouse. So their flood tables like go through like a, like a, uh, um, like it, it's all on wheels. So it just like, it automatically rolls to the spot. It's got like a, a spot where it's got this machine. that's the giant, giant, like vacuum sucker. And it just sucks up everything in it. And then there's a, what? a, a big machine that like turns it upside down and washes it. And then, and then it goes back out and ready to, to, um, uh, to go out in the, in the greenhouse and be planted again. But again, this is a very large, scale. you can watch it. There's a video on, on the Migrants Gazali YouTube channel, um, Green, Belt, Green Belt Organics. It's really cool. Uh, how to do that with a microgreens farm that's vertical where you don't really want the trays to come out. That's where it's a lot more challenging. And, uh, and I like, this is again, a large scale farm. So they probably spent like a hundred thousand dollars just on that piece of equipment. It's like very, large scale. <laughs> um, but it was very cool just to see as a solution to have like some sort of strong vacuum suction system would be a good way to get all the water and, and dirt out. Uh, and then you just disinfect it in some capacity. That would be, in my opinion, the most efficient way uh, to wash flood tables without taking them out, but it's still manual. Um, but just having like a really, really high powered vacuum, it seems like it, I was, I was shocked at how well it worked. Like it was insane. Um, but that's yeah, crazy. Maybe, maybe your uncle can, can, uh, <laughs> <Next project. laughs> convert a shop vac into this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We do a little bit of that, uh, similar methodology. It's just shop vac and then, uh, just clean up all the debris and then 
spraying it down with yeah, uh, I mean, peroxide. It was easy when the shelf was only up seven feet high, but now we're at twelve <laughs> feet. I, and it's I'm a little scary little, now. I'm not afraid of heights, but I'm afraid to stand on the very top of the ladder. <laughs> are you using a regular ladder? Right now we are. Right now, but, but it's, yeah, it's mostly because we just moved we, in. Yeah, I, I'm looking for like a staircase equipment. ladder. For yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, no, it's it's it's. Uh, I remember I was in the same position. I started with the ladder. I'm like, there's no way I can have staff on this ladder. Like someone's going to get injured for sure. So we got, we That's actually got, <laughs> just, just so you know, the two types for everyone to know uh, when they get to the state, there's, there's a, a regular safety ladder, uh, which they have at like Home Depot. And then there's a one which is like longer. So the steps are less steep. Um, in, just from a safety perspective, the one that's longer and less steep is much safer to go up and down. Um, so just, yeah, just so you know, for, like if you're buying one, they're not cheap. So you might as well just like spend the extra hundred or 200 bucks to get the, the yeah. longer one. Um, and there might be a place you can go see them anyway, a little bit off topic. Yeah, um, I had dreams of like a <laughs> library ladder just on the, <laughs> yeah, that, I, I had dreams as well. um, that would be, that would be really nice. I never ended up doing that though, but maybe, maybe you guys will do it. If you do, definitely let me know. I'd love to see something like that implemented in, uh, in, in my green farm. You're on the ladder and you're vacuuming. <laughs> and like you're at the front and you just like push and it goes like this way with, so you don't even have to move. You can just like push the button. Just like yeah, back and forth. Oh, yeah. it's genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be cheap, but you never know. Maybe it's worth it. Um, just back to the lights before I forget. Um, you mentioned you switched to the Barina. Are those the, the Barina 42 watt, four foot like standard fixtures? Do you know, like, I'm just curious if they have a newer one at this point. That's been like what I've been recommending for a while now. And I'm just curious if uh, if it's something um, uh, different than that. Um, but maybe while you guys look that up, um, we can, uh, I'll just ask the one last question. I love asking farms. Um, if you can go back to when you started your farm and meet the younger version of yourselves, uh, what advice would you give both yourselves to set them up for success? Kate, go first. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> uh, get organized early. Because there were times where when we were, I, I wasn't really like full time helping Chris even yet, but I would come in and he'd be harvesting by himself and we didn't know where anything was supposed to go. We were doing deliveries out of a cooler without any idea what went where or anything. Yeah. I was <laughs> frantically calling him like, hey, do you have an extra radish? I got to drop by the market to get it because I don't have enough for the delivery. Uh, just get organized. Uh, find creative ways to know where everything is or where everything's going and keeping counts of everything, all your inventory, because I can't tell you how many times I've been panicking, ordering stuff early on off Amazon before I learned how to source anything um, that we didn't have enough containers. And I was yeah. like, how the heck are we, <laughs> we have a farmer's market this week. Uh, so just getting organized. That's number one. That's, that's number one thing I wish I would have, done better and had a better like idea of what I even needed to do when we were just starting out. Mm -hmm. yeah, for me, um, it's definitely, well, it's not like advice to, to ourselves in a way it is, but it, I, I think Kate and I always joke, we have gone through everything, every like mistake you can make. I've done it. I've done every iteration of everything wrong and it was awesome. I think that it was like, like, we love to joke about it now. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's you know, it, it, so it, like when the moment, like, cause we care a lot. It's so stressful. You're like, I'm, I'm dying. It's the, it's the end. You know, it's just like, it, it was, it's that level of extreme, but like, you have to like appreciate the journey, like the whole process, the entire mess is awesome. <laughs> I think, I think it's a, I mean, it's, it's not like the best advice, but you just kind of need to struggle through it and just keep going. You learn so much and just never quit. I really think the big thing is just never quit. Mm. Um, it sucks. It doesn't always get better. <laughs> like in terms of like a lot of time, like, it, things will improve, but like not like the timelines or the stress, like the challenges that that piece doesn't go away. Uh, but I think it's part of part of life. It's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's the, those are both great pieces of advice. I think organization is so critical. Um, like my early staff that I hired in the early years could attest to like, I should have been more organized. They would have made their life and my life and everyone's life just a lot easier. Um, and, and then also to, to your point, Chris, um, I think it's, it's 
brilliant. Like the mistakes are going to happen. Like you're going to have difficulties. The better you can handle those things, uh, the like the less stress you have from the situation. Don't get me wrong. Like I think a- anyone running a business is going to experience some level of stress, but the better you can handle those stresses, uh, the the and the more you can see it as opportunities, which it sounds like you you've gotten very good at at uh, at seeing it that way. Um, it, the, the easier uh, it gets mentally to to do these very difficult things in running a business. So um, uh, and then also like the personal like like the more you can handle stress in general, the more you can handle stress. So like whether it's in your business or in your personal life or like you know unfortunate things happen in, in life, like you can handle it better. Uh, the more experience you have in that space, um, and it becomes less like the level. I can imagine like in the early years for me, and I, I would I, tell me if, if if this if this resonates as well. Like something that would stress me on the early years may not even like like phase me at all, you know, because I'm just so used to dealing with that kind of stress. But it's always the new like the new uh, nuanced things that like I haven't experienced a lot of that will allow, like t- take me to a new level of stress that will allow me to like figure out, okay, I can handle this. How do I best do this? And it's not always smooth sailing. And I, I'm, I like, there's been times where I'm like overwhelmed. I've had many periods in running the business where I'm like, oh my God, like, how am I going to manage this issue or this challenge? <laughs> um, and have like almost sleepless nights over, it, you know, but each time you deal with this, uh, an issue, you get more, com- you build your confidence and allows you to, to manage that challenge in the business easier and more effectively and less and have it have less of an impact on your on your mental state. Yeah, the, those is the, the worst stressful moments are the most memorable <laughs> as well. Yeah. It's always yeah. these are always the golden days. I think you always remember like, like to your point, like the, a lot of those things didn't really matter that much. They, they really didn't. We just just care tremendously at the, the moment in time. Um, but like I always, I always like, like, like tell Kay, I'm like, these are the golden days when we're going, really going through it. Like, this is it. This is what we're going to remember. These are awesome times. Like, we have so many stories of just like, that's what we did. <laughs> that was what yeah. we were worried about. Just little things that just. What do they call uh, it? Type yeah. two fun? <laughs> Type two fun. <laughs> it's not fun when you're doing it, but in reflection, it is hilariously fun. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That, that, that's, 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 that, that's, that's, that's the way to do it. Honestly, that's, that's the way. Um, yeah, I'm so glad you guys have that mindset. It's it's so important, um, and I'm still learning it. So like, I don't want to make it seem like I figured that out. I'm just in the process of learning it. Um, uh, but by any chance, before we wrap up, were you able to see figure out the the Barina light? Just because I, I know people are gonna are gonna be curious about that. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, you're right. It is just the. I think I don't. I assume that things haven't really changed much. But it's the just the 42 watt one. Yeah. It's full spectrum. Yeah, uh, you you can see it on Amazon. We a lot of um at least. From what I've seen, uh, from just like Instagram, a lot of people use like the T5 ones that are they're um, they're just like the really cheap yeah, white yeah. light, but the full spectrum make it's it's oh, yeah. worth the investment. They're a little For bit sure. more, but it's absolutely worth it. I've been so thrilled with how the plants look. And, and honestly, they're really cheap. Like people don't like when I started yes. buying LEDs. I started buying LEDs in 2014. I was like one of the first ones I knew of. Like my greens farms are using LEDs. They were like a hundred dollars a fixture. You can get it for like $20, $25, like a four foot fixture. Uh, and I had to buy them from uh, uh, overseas, pay like crazy duties, crazy, crazy like customs fees um, because you just couldn't get them here. Now you can just buy it on Amazon and get it like next day. It's it's crazy. And they're, they're, you know, they're the barinas are pretty damn good. Like I've gotten some great results with them. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're a great affordable light. I haven't had really any, like I, I grow bonsai trees with them and they're totally fine. Um, so like they're, you could definitely grow flowers with them. Um, as long as you have enough, enough of them. Um, but they're, they're very cheap. It's like the, the cost ratio, it just doesn't make sense to buy any really anything else other than if you want to like upgrade beyond that, but to buy like cheaper lights for how, uh, good quality the barinas and growth you get are. It's just well worth it, in my opinion. So I'm glad you guys are switching to to those in the new facility. Um, yeah, I was gonna have the the, um, the I mean the cheaper T5 lights they're completely functional. Like we, I'm not I, we still use them. Um, I'll replace them with time, but yeah. like there's no they're, they're they work. They work totally fine. Um, it's not as like high quality product, but it's not significant enough where it 
it matters like too too uh, much. So I think anyone could start a business with like with either or. Mm. But uh, as I think like you so when you do this a million times, you start to like see the nuances of it, and you start to go like, oh, that's awesome. Like little details that like probably no one cares about, yeah, like yeah. the end consumers. Like if someone's just eating microgreens, you know, they don't they might not appreciate it as as much because they just don't see it as often. But there are there are customers that will notice the difference. Like for example, the stronger lights you have, generally uh, the more crunchy the leaves will be. And that's an ex mm -hmm. like if someone's eating as a like as a garnish, someone may not notice it at a restaurant, you know. But as a salad, someone may notice and be like, "Oh, these these are like there's there's definitely people that that maybe it's one five percent I don't know of the people that buy it they will notice it, but it's not. Yeah, you're right. Like most people are just like buy the microgreen, use it in the way they normally use it, and may not know the difference. But you are selling a higher quality product, which will make your life easier in the long run. Like the higher the quality is, the easier it is to sell without like marketing or sales and that sort of thing. At least that's been what okay. I've noticed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is a great podcast, tons of great information. I love your guys story and, and mindset on, on running the business and just seeing how much you're growing. It's incredible. Um, if listeners want to connect more with you guys uh, and learn more about your farm, where can they find you online and on social media? Yeah. Um, online, our website is spira.farm, S P I R A dot farm. Um, there's no dot com. It's dot farm. I was really excited about that domain. <laughs> um, and uh, our, our our best like, email would be like contact that's great dot farm. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, on Instagram and Facebook. It will just be at Spear Farms. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much, guys, for coming on. It was it was a great episode. Thanks, Jonah. Thank you, Jonah. <laughs> it was fun. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Microgreens businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.